Welcome back to the country, everybody. And we have a new champion. So we're going to start with Rest and Sets in there. <laughs> yeah, so Oscar, Real Madrid, they finally did it. 4 0, officially La Liga champions. Where was this title won for them? Um, it was won really in that stretch in December when they had to play. Um, Atleti, Atletic Club twice, Sevilla, you know, really strong teams. Real so said that the way, and they won all of those games convincingly. The only game in that period of time they didn't win was against Cadiz, which was funny. But yeah, that was the period where it was confirmed that Real Madrid are just a different level to the other La Liga challengers. And the fact that another thing is in the between January, February, when Real Madrid are having a rough time, it also helped them that their nearest challenger, Sevilla, were also having a rough time and just became out of sorts. Yeah. And if we're to speak about the team, what's the biggest change between last season with Zidane's team and this season? I think the biggest change is increased productivity alongside Benzema because last season, Benzema had... 30 goals in all competitions. The next highest score was Casemiro with seven. Yeah. Now that now that that's completely different now. Vinicius Jr. was the one of the biggest surprises of the season. You know, from match day one, match day two, when he started scoring goals, he started feeling, hey, something's changed with this kid. And yeah. he and Benzema, their relationship, their telepathy has carried Real Madrid in the times where Real Madrid were not functioning as a unit. Yeah, that, that's so true. Even in that Chelsea game, he gave Benzema two assists and one in the first mm-hmm. five runs. Like, and that relationship, it's been one of the strongest relationships, not only in Spain, but also in Europe. You're I think right it, in yeah, you it should be the strongest in Europe at this point because the only other one that was as productive was Nabri and um, Lewandowski, and Nabri has cooled off the, a lot. Yeah, and those two players... In addition with Thibaut Courtois, they are the three of them together. And maybe you can put elephants of those five. They're what made Real Madrid win the league in general. Yeah. The, the, fir- the first three you mentioned were absolutely crucial because I think anyone else they could have probably done without if they got injured for a long time. Another thing is that we have to credit someone and um, Pintos, the Real Madrid fitness coach. Real Madrid haven't had any serious injury problems this season to their main players. So that's another big reason why they've won the league because everyone has always been ready to go. You know, everyone has always been fit, sharp, mentally and physically. And that, that's something that affected them last season because last season mm-hmm. they were the team that had the most injuries, the most absences with COVID. Mm-hmm. And that sort of affected them in the types of structure for most of the first half of the season. Mm-hmm. And you're right in like mentioning how Pintus has come in and has changed Real Madrid physically. Because even I had a friend who supports Inter Miami was telling me that what Pintus did for the team was amazing because they were always fit, they were always ready to go physically. And that's a big reason why Inter won the league with a big margin in Serie A last year. And mm-hmm. He's done the same thing for Real Madrid. He was also there, I believe, in 2017 when they won the European double. Maybe they might win the European double this season, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because keeping your best players fit is really important. Like, you look at the other challengers. Barcelona lost how many important players. Sevilla lost important players. Athletic, too. You just wonder with them, what could have been different if certain players were fit for a longer period of time? We'll never know because that's football. You have to deal with what you get. And again, we'll get to the rivals a bit later on, but let's talk about Benzema for a minute. Like he's, we were running out of words to describe. He has to win the ball for this season. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. It's hard for me to say, but I guess so. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's, 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 been, he's been phenomenal this season, you know. The numbers he's put up in domestic and European competitions are worthy of a Ballon d'Or. 
and it just feels like as the opponents get harder and harder, just he gets better. Level. Yeah, he rises to the occasion every time. It's just, and, yeah, it's just amazing what he's done. Yes, and Spanaka penalty against Teddy was delicious. Yeah, and let's talk about that city game for a moment. And yeah, it's was for me that's one of the best semi final games I've in my life. Yeah, it was a very great semi final. Man City were excellent in attack, should have probably put one or two chances away. But the thing with Real Madrid is they just don't know when they're beaten. They're okay, they're like. My one of my favorite anime characters that's always like, I'm never going to give up. That's why Real Madrid, are, you know. Yeah. And yeah, they made a real game of it. I feel yeah, though, yeah, go on. Yeah, because it was like at that point, like every time City was about to, they got the two early goals, and every time they were about to stretch the lead to three goals, Real Madrid scored. So it was a crazy sort of game. It's a game that see so they could have finished five on City, and I don't think. Anyone would have had met them and was given the ball of chances that it had. But Benzema, again, mm-hmm. and Vinicius, like he made a mistake for that third goal that City scored, but his, his goal was yeah. incredible as well. Yeah, it, it was great individual play from both of them. I feel, remember last week when we were saying where Real Madrid will hurt City and it's with yeah. the fullbacks? Yeah, the injuries Mansty had that right back definitely didn't help their cause to keep a clean sheet against Real Madrid because Fernandinho is, you know, he's not a right back and he hasn't been playing that much. So it was mission impossible to keep Vinicius Jr. quiet. Uh, this cross for City start goal was delicious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he obviously he's still a quality player and he still has the end product in him. He's just, yeah. Asking him to play out of position against one of the best wingers in the world this season. Of course, he's going to have more bad times than good times in the game. And going into the second leg, how do we rate around this? So because I'm hearing that Walker and Kato will be back. I see City will be straight in defense. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. from a Real Madrid point of view, they're going to have Casper back. He played as this weekend. Mm-hmm. But they're going to have Alaba, who's not going to be able to do an actual step up. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be, it's not It's not going to be easy for Real Madrid, but with the improvements once they are going to get. But you have to remember, this is, this feels so similar to that first leg against PSG, where PSG should have scored at least train the first leg. In the second leg, they were dominating until one crucial moment changed the flow of the game because that's how knockout football is. So I guess Real Madrid, as long as they stay in the game, it's a one goal difference. They have every chance to go through. It won't surprise me at all if they win 3-0 even. <laughs> yeah. uh, like City, they won for the weekend, so it looks like they're ready to go. Uh, in terms of the midfield shape, Casemiro coming in, would you keep it as Valverde, Kroos, Modric, or do you maybe put in Camavinga for one of those two? I'd keep Valverde, um, Modric, and Casemiro together. I wouldn't drop Rodrigo because of the great game he had at the weekend against Espanyol. Like, you have to reward his good form with games, right? Yeah. Yeah, but he has to do better than against City because against City, I felt he was very, very tame. He didn't take on Zinchenko at all. Like, he needs to learn from Vinicius. Like, you don't have to be... You shouldn't be a friendly winger to your fullback. You need to be aggressive with them. So that's something Rodrigo can definitely add to his game. Yeah. We'll be hoping that uh, the people score up to the point that Real Madrid can get over the line and avoid a limit. City final. Liverpool. Not everyone wants Real Madrid to get over the line. <laughs> Not everyone, yeah. So yeah. I'm sure you don't want it, but okay. Viva Man yeah. City. Viva Man City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Liverpool, the other half, they went against Villarreal with a spray school Villarreal coming to some pundits. And not the game, does it? <laughs> Who is that guy anyway? 
<laughs> such a guy. Yeah. Who I'm sure has never played champ- multiple levels of football. I'm sure that guy has been played against a foreign team before. <laughs> Let a little Champions League football. <laughs> yeah. And with the Real though, they they were a bit they were a bit disappointed with the game. Like I understand what Emery was trying to do tactically. He was trying to keep it zero zero, mm-hmm. um, get to the second leg, then play. But the problem with those like a lot of those concerns were pragmatic because when you're playing that, you always leave yourself open to an error. And that mm-hmm. one goal changed the dynamic because like you were up until then. Although Liverpool were pressing and pressing and pressing, they weren't there weren't that many chances that I'm like, oh, that's a good chance. But in those five minutes, the dynamic changed so much. Yeah. I feel like with Villarreal's approach, it's not I feel like when they wanted to attack, they just couldn't get out because Liverpool's pressing was so intense. I feel like not a lot of people are giving that particular point enough justice because I'm sure Villarreal, we know that they are normally organized, but they are always very lethal in counter-attacks. And Liverpool, credit to them, they did very well to stop the counter-attacks at the source. You know, Paris, who is normally the instigator, thought he had a really, really off day against Liverpool. He had to be taken off. So, yeah, the plan was good. It's just, like you said, that luck, the luck you have is like the, def- the deflection from the cross takes it into the post instead of outside the post, which post, yeah. would often be so. It's just like luck obviously wasn't on your side that night. And then to concede and the second goal quickly, you know. And in that second goal, mm-hmm. Pokalan was like pulling up injured. So that's why he was taking money. And yeah, but like you have to give Liverpool credit. They were possibly the team in the world at the moment. So going there, Sanfield for the area with that atmosphere that they have been looking at most of the day for them. Do we see any chances for them in this? Can they maybe win 2 0 and take this? It's, it's possible for Villarreal to score if Gerard is back. It's just you need to attack more, and that will play into Liverpool's hands. So I don't know nothing is impossible, but it's hard to see past Liverpool scoring. I can see this second leg ending maybe a one goal margin, but a high scoring game either way. If Villarreal decides to attack quickly and try and get a first goal, but the important and thing is yeah, the important thing is to just at least stay in the time to close to the end. You never know what could happen. Yeah, because that's what they did against Bayern, and that's I think that's something that disappointed me in this game is that Liverpool scored so quickly after they scored the first goal. Yeah, and they so sort of, it sort of felt like third, the fourth was going to come. They they lost their confidence, their heads dropped, and what they did well against Bayern is when they did concede that goal, their heads they, they were still steered to concede. But going into that second leg, you're right, Gerard coming back makes a world of difference. What are the changes do you think they should make? Do you think? With Cockland, they've played with four midfielders. Do you think they should just stick to the three in midfield and maybe Gerard plays along with Kia and Benz? I'd honestly, for a second, like if I was Emery, I'd take, I'd take a bit of it, more, more of a risk. I'd play Dia, Gerard, Dan Juma, and Los Celso, and then Pereira and um, Capoe. Cool. I'd, I'd take Cockland out. Another yeah, option, I... another option is to play my Gomez because my Gomez is contra- comfortable being a central midfielder and is intelligent enough to try and find spaces on the counter attack. So instead of Dia, my Gomez is a good option. Yeah, yeah, I think so as well. But it seems like their minds are on the second because in La Liga they they showed again against the relegation threatened side out there, <laughs> which makes. That picture, like we'll talk on Alaves a bit because that win changes the scenario in that relegation battle for them. It seems like yeah. they have a chance. Yeah, massively. They have a chance now, especially as you know, certain clubs did what they were supposed to do and make the relegation battle interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because Mallorca 
drop points. Cardis, I mean, it's you can say Cardis, it was a point gained and Granada dropped points too. So it's really interesting now. The two goals from Alves have really, you know, given them a chance to stay up, which is what you want to see. You want you don't want to see anyone just go down like Cordoba in 2015 or <laughs> the three of them that went down together in 2018. Like you want to see yeah. drama and have every fixture be meaningful until the end of the season. Like next week is going to be beautiful picture, and let's keep let's keep the beam. Uh... In the race to the bottom, let's support my Barcelona. Uh, mm-hmm. Barcelona, they went into this game losing three games in a row. But they played well. Yeah. They had a couple of chances. We have to go up for Antoros. The easy chances. Yeah. It's even fair and it's not about, I mean, if you get chances, it's fine. My problem was that the team, it felt like they were ignoring him completely on that right hand side because. <laughs> I looked, you got the attacks at halftime, nine on the left, eight through the middle, zero on the right. I'm like, did Ferran Torres do something to Danny Alves? Because he's just ignoring him. And a few times, honestly, I've always had this, I've always been of the opinion that Ferran should play on the right because those diagonal runs he makes inside are pretty hard to stop. Because when he did it a few times in the game, I was like, wow, this is really good. It's better than when he's on the left. I could prefer someone like the pie or fatty on the left that are more comfortable taking defenders in a certain way. So yeah, for Ferran, it's a mixed game. His teammates didn't want to give him the ball. And Mallorca, they threatened later late on. They brought on Google and the game. And mm-hmm. There was a chance that after they scored the fifth goal in the second half, it seemed like they could still have drawn. Yeah. If it would have felt that way, but Barcelona, at least, we did well enough to not give them any other opportunity. Because the thing is that Mallorca have only scored, the only thing that scored less goals than Mallorca all seasons are our best. So they weren't always going to create loads of chances against us. A lot of their good work would have come from us making stupid mistakes, which we made in the build up to that free kick they got. So, even yeah. though it's a chance that Bernie could hurt. Yeah, he could have made it 1 0 and would have seen the yeah. same bloody script for the third La Liga home game in the row. But, you know, yeah. thankfully, unlike Cadiz and Rayo, Mallorca are not efficient with the one or two chances they got. And that's going to be a problem for Mallorca when they run out of the Because that, like a lot of Spanish coaches, when it gets to the stage of season, they're like, oh, this game is. Final or is it and famous you say this every single game right they played. Yeah. But that is a final in every sense of the word because if Mallorca wins, that shows up for an Yeah. Uh, if Mallorca win, I think they are practice they've practically sentenced Levante. Yeah. If Granada win, it also makes things difficult for Levante if they don't win. So I think the best team for us neutrals is a draw, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, but you're right, it's a massive game for both of them. Like a win could do so much, especially against your fellow rival, because a win against Barcelona is a bonus, which Cad has got. So yeah. Yeah, and Granada this weekend, they yeah, you can say it's a missed opportunity because Salto they have nothing to play for. Mm-hmm. Salto were winning, they came back late on. With me, uh, how yeah. important has it been for Bernard? Because he scored a couple of big goals and he's a one for me. Yeah. Luis Mia is too good to go down to second division. So I don't know about that. <laughs> but yeah, he's really good. He's, he's been their most consistent performer this season. And as you've said, he's come up clutch with late goals. And the late goals things is something that Granada have actually been fond of this season because. Molina has scored important late goals. Suarez has as well. Um, they, stri- they almost scored a late equalizer against Sevilla, but then they were put to sort pretty quickly. So this is a team that, you know, under the three coaches they've had, they don't give up easily. Yeah. And hopefully, like, we see, we see fireworks in that game. There mm-hmm. were fireworks in the Valencia derby between Levante and Valencia and Levante. 
And Valencia, they, they took the lead early on. They got a red card. Levante, despite 10 men, they still couldn't win in the start. They never won in the start of the history. Yeah, th- yeah, this was... I mean, it's the biggest missed opportunity of the weekend, <laughs> honestly. Because Valencia should have been in a very moody state because he just lost the cup final in a heartbreaking way. So basically, they could have just looked at it and was like, we don't really need, what are we playing for, you know? And Levante, who are desperate, like you said, didn't take advantage of the 10 minute situation. And I saw a stat that Levante, if results had went a certain way this weekend, they could have been relegated by next week. So thankfully for them, Mallorca lost and Granada dropped points too. So they live to fight, but they're rapidly running out of chances. And their next chance is against Real Sociedad. They tied against Rayo, and it seemed like basically if Sorla had if they had won the game, they would have been so close to the place. Yeah. But so Real Sociedad, the same issues, mm-hmm. no goals. Yeah. Another missed opportunity because having looked at the other results from the top four teams, and to be fair to Real Sociedad, they were in control of this one for a long time. It's just the lack of goal, you know? Yeah, and, and then, the magic of Oti Gray. Yeah. And then Ryo start, and once Ryo get their goal, they become on top, and then it feels as if Russo said are kind of lucky to get away with the point. Yeah, it's a big missed opportunity for him and outside. Yeah, especially given how Atletico this weekend. Did you watch that game? Yeah, I saw the game. Do you understand what Simone was trying to do with this formation? Because I still have no idea. I have no idea what Simone and the players thought the thought was at stake. I, I, honestly, it's like Athletic Club won that game from the fe- from the fe- when the whistle was blown. And it was just weird. Like Athletic didn't seem didn't seem like they wanted to be up for it. It felt as if they would rather be somewhere else than playing to get into top four, which was very strange. Yeah, because they felt almost like a lifeless team. Like there was, it was like they were playing a testimonial or- I know, or right? They had a yeah, big Champions weird. League semi-final coming yeah. up and they just wanted to fulfill that picture list. That's how yeah. it felt, like no aching in the word, but no passion, no, no passion, no desire. Yeah, but besides all of that, Athletic club were comfortably having more possession than athletic for long stretches. That shouldn't really be happening. Like me and you, we've talked about how athletic get, the athletic midfield gets dominated by Cadiz and Alaves among others. Yeah. So this isn't a new problem. Like it's a problem that all black after the match was like, we don't know what's happening, but we'll try and solve it. I'm like, you have four games left. I don't. You yeah. can't solve this problem in four games. You, except you really showed that grit and determination to try and get results. Yeah, and next week, we have the Madrid Derby coming up. And that's a real, there's a chance that let's see like here, Champions League. Like it's a real possibility because we're not playing as a team in the last couple of weeks, or even I'll say throughout the season, besides the first four games and those, and that run of six games, mm-hmm. leading up to the Mexican United. Okay? Let's have been a lifeless team. They've been a team that they haven't really played well. They haven't deserved to be a top four side. And I feel this season has been the biggest missed opportunity for them in La Liga because mm-hmm. I think they have a squad that's capable of winning this league. Exactly. I feel the same way because minus their defense. And I only thought their defense wasn't good enough to challenge for the league because there were only four center backs and they were playing the back three. That's the only reason, just because of quantity. But quality wise, I thought, well, these guys have what it takes to um, win back to back leagues for the first time in forever. But yeah. yeah, like it's been a massive letdown. The big reasons for their success last season Suarez, you know, he hasn't gotten as many games because he's not really mobile anymore. Marcos Sierrante and Trippier, you know, their form dropped and Trippier left. Other players, Hermoso, 
just regressed. He his regression is worse than Longley after the Bayern game. Yeah. <laughs> like it's his, Adam Atreyri sets him back. After that, I, I mean, even before Adam Atreyri put the nail in the coffin, Hermoso was struggling all season. Jimenez is the only defender that can hold his head up high, but he's he has so many injury problems that. Savage has to play a lot. Felipe and Hermoso have to play a lot. It's uh, it's been a basket case for Atleti. The problem for them is if they don't make it into the top four yes, and that sets the project a lot. And I feel even if they do make it into the top four, something has to change mm-hmm. in the culture of that because they are playing more like. Real, or like not really, nothing like Real Madrid, but like I remember watching Real Madrid in the past, right? And they had that same issue, like when they had the Galacticos and everything, where mm-hmm. it was always a disjointed team, and you never really knew what you're into. That's, and that's how I feel like, or like when you're watching a team like Manchester United right now, it's a group where Atleti beat, and you get that same vibes from them. It's like, yeah, they're a, a collection of individuals mm-hmm. just playing together. Yeah. That's the word for it. Like, there's no, there's no team there. It's just quality individuals, and you know, the things that quality can only take you so far. You need to have a basis or a foundation, because quality, like Felix, let's say Felix, for example, will be good for one or two months, and obviously will naturally drop off. But you need that foundation, like you said, and that hasn't been there at all. All black and uh, like all black has. I think All Black is the perfect way to describe athletic season. It's been mixed. All Black will have some brilliant games sometimes, and then he will let in a goal like the Rowdy Thomas goal the other day. Yeah. Yeah. But let's talk about their opponents for a moment. Classico, they're one mm-hmm. point then yeah, for in the race for the conference league. Ooh, exciting stuff. <laughs> and Yaki Williams scored a brace. And this Paneko is like pretty. Good. Like, do you think? Well, is it a brace? W- I thought that was an angle. Let, let's call it brace first. Let's <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. Brace. <laughs> let's call it brace. Uh, do you feel there's a chance they can maybe get into that top seven? And yeah, it's possible. Europe, it's very possible now to get into top seven because you have to remember they have the head to head advantage over Villarreal if they were to finish level one points. Because yeah. they beat them in San Mamez and drew at Asaramica. And Villarreal, the likelihood is that they will be out of Europe by the next time La Liga resumes. And I think they have a harder fixture than the athletic club, club. So the race is definitely on for top seven for athletic. And possibly they could dream of Europa League because they're not that far behind Real Sociedad. No, they're five points behind Real Sociedad. You know what? I'm I'm not sure how that would affect up this. They thought that their mid-table team without being in Europe, and I wonder how much strain being in Europe will be for them. It will it's be a strain, especially since they don't sign other players and they have to rely on the academy boys and having to play so many young and experienced players at the same time will definitely affect your form. So, and yeah. and if they can handle European football now. Yeah, and there's also speculation about Marcelino's future with mm-hmm. the next coach of the Spanish nations. Do you think that would be a good appointment? Yeah. I think if Atleti, it depends on how Athletic Club can bring in. But I, I don't think too many coaches out there right now would necessarily improve on Marcelino, mm-hmm. especially with the squad they have. I don't know. The football they played on Sunday was brilliant. They were pressing, mm-hmm. really creative chances. Why do Athletic Club have this playing this way against big sides, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Sevilla, but mm-hmm. even better this season in Villarreal against the smaller sides? You don't see that same level of like concentration and intensity. I feel it's because. The bigger sides, right, aren't they don't really play the way athletic do. So when they come up against a team that's different to them in terms of 
the intensity and the passion. It's like a shock to the system. And how well you can dis- recover from that shock depends on what you're going to do in the game. For the smaller clubs, a lot of them play with passion too. So I think it cancels out what Athletic does. That's true. And that's something that Athletic used to do, but now yeah. it seems like they're yeah, athletic, taking on better. Athletic just don't physically impose themselves on teams anymore. Yeah, which, which is strange, right? Because they're a team that was known for, even if they didn't have the quality to mm-hmm. break down a team, like you knew you were always there for a scrap whenever you're playing against Athletic. And now, yeah. Don't see that. I don't see that at all. Now, now it feels so easy. Yeah. yeah. But with Sevilla as well, they're, they're like a flexible way. And every time I watch both of them play, it feels like their attacks are slow motion. You can see the play that they want to do, like three moves ahead. Yeah. And it's I thought they were good against Cadet, Sevilla. I didn't. I didn't really think so, to be honest. I felt you didn't think so in the first half. In the in the first thirty minutes, yes, but then after a while, I was like, "What am I watching?" Like, yeah, they they didn't. It's like with Sevilla, they choose to. Sevilla can have it in them to play to be more intense in transitions and everything. They just choose to play it safe a lot and. When they slowed down the tempo of the game, which was going in their favor, it allowed Cadiz to start getting little, little footholds back into it. And obviously, I mean, Bono can't do anything about that great free kick, but oh, <laughs> that, that was that, like Leo Messi would see that and have nice feelings. I don't, I don't want to, kids might listen to this. I don't want to say what I wanted to say. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was a great free kick from the Casperas and yeah. uh, Cadiz those, could have won too. Yeah. Oh yeah, they, they, could. they could have won. Bono, Bono Zamora, tre- Zamora trophy seriously on life support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess we'd be happy that Ramiro conceded today. Yeah, uh, uh, and you'll be hoping and I'll be hoping that Courtois will take the rest of the season off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I doubt oh, it. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sure Real Madrid will want to ruin Athletic's chances as much as possible. Yeah. But with Cadiz, right, they, it seems now they have, out of all the teams that are in that battle, they seem like the team with Clarice Fields. You yeah. can see what they try to do. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, their they're front counter attack is so yeah, Cad is when they counter attack, they do it pretty fast. And it's unless it, they're playing, unless you're playing against them, it's actually nice to see them take the transitions really well. Sergio, you know, and that Sergio coming in was a big boost, and then the transfer window has been really good. Lucas Perez is a quality player that I don't know why Alaves didn't try and keep him because he, they've missed his goals. Uh, yeah, Cadiz look the strongest team in that running. Everyone else, I definitely think, can go down, but I don't see Cadiz going down at this point. I'll be like our pretty on that. Just the last game we had, you know, you had some players. Also, so you know, today, two mid-table teams not really doing much, going anywhere. So. Mm, yeah. They just... <laughs> Fulfilling the fixtures, I guess, but you know, it was a great start here is that Ante Budimir has scored six games in a row consecutively. That's pretty impressive. I believe it's the first off to do that. Yeah, it's the first player to do that. He matched someone's record for scoring five consecutively last week, and this week he owns the record now, which is great for him. That's a track, right? Speaking of like you made a point about Cadiz, like the next opponents are okay, who have so few things to play for. And that just draws into the fact that Cadiz might be the team to kind of stay up. They might be the most likely to stay up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Cadiz are most likely because they have a manager that's very experienced. The other man, some of the other managers in this situation is like, Basically, all of them, the bottom three, their managers, and that experience with saving teams from relegation. 
just Cadiz and Mallorca's coach, um, Javier Aguirre. Yeah. So you're going for Cadiz and Mallorca. I'm going for. Okay, I'm going for Cadiz to stop. I'm going for. I'm going to see Alaves somehow stay up again. <laughs> I, I don't like to pull out countries, but I'll be pissed if they stay up. What are you going to say? If we lose Granada and Levante and not Alaves. I mean, I want, the, I want Granada to go just because I'm a petty human. <laughs> 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 but. I mean, I would have liked to see Mallorca's project and their goals develop, but, you know, if you're a Euro club, you're a Euro club and just <laughs> stay in Segunda for a bit until you figure things out. Well, like, as I mentioned earlier, when I started this podcast, the team that had a reason to celebrate was Racing Santa Fe. And because they are committed to this division, you follow the deputy when the third division. Pain. <laughs> and <laughs> but but this this is good news for Spanish boys into having one of those like giant cops who are in third division and we get mm-hmm. Yeah. Racing are a falling giant in every sense of the word. And honestly, it's nice to see them back in Segunda. You just hope that they can stay there and be consistent there and maybe challenge for to get back into Primera, but you know, just don't go down immediately like other teams would. So, and Barcelona already saw one of the best players. So, yeah, Barcelona, we're getting Pablo Torre. I hope he's a good player. You know, and yeah. And yeah. for Depor, I'm like, we had this in the bag in January. I was so <laughs> confident. Then a different team started playing the fixtures. Like it got so it got so like not only there's drama in Depor, but this season it wasn't as much except for this Depor player, right? Yeah. I don't want to mess up his name, but basically he's a Betis fan. And he went <laughs> to the Copa de Rey final to watch Betis instead of playing him fixture for Depor. Instead, what he told um Depor was like he has COVID, so he can't play the game. <laughs> so the club found out and now his contract has been rescinded. <laughs> Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy, yeah, it's crazy but there. at least his journey wasn't wasted. Eh? <laughs> if, no, if, no. if Valencia won it, he'd be feeling pretty terrible by now. Yeah, it, honestly, it's, it's outstanding how many fans in Spanish, how many players in Spanish are better fans. But let's not dwell on Spanish football too much. Let's move to Serie A, which has been crazy. Did, did, so you see, did you see Han? Did you see Andanovic's great goalkeeping on Wednesday? Yeah, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> like, I I saw that play, and how is this going to be a goal? <laughs> like, even last season, Inter's tried to win. Some Inter fans I follow are like, they're not sure, but they were always if they criticized one player, it was always Andanovic, <laughs> and. Like to have your catch up game be messed up by a stupid mistake like that is just it's just Syria. Like nobody wants to win the scudetto. It's next week. <laughs> yeah, next week, I wonder which Milan player is going to make their own expensive mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the good thing for Inter is they came back, they beat you the Nase, Lots of mm-hmm. Harmaturs got on got on score sheet. Mm-hmm. Milan. They won one zero against Fiorentina, and Rafael Leal its second goal, and they they look on they look set to win this. They yeah. look set to win this right now. Yeah. They have their head over Inter. Yeah. It will take a big mess up for them. Mm-hmm. The team, what sets Milan apart from the other teams is that their defense is really good. And they are and they are very used to grinding out results by now, especially from the second half of the season. It's just that you know the the drop points they got against Bologna, that nil nil, like it's one of those frustrating things where you just wish they could score more goals and win games with more ease, you know. Yeah. But you know what Bologna they sound like a good team because they took points off Milan, they took points off Roma this weekend. They sort of screwed up Inter's tactics charge. So. Sort of, sort of. 
<laughs> sort of. They, they stay. <laughs> yeah. But also, also in Serie A, Juventus, they, they're back in the Champions League. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, 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 like, right, right. They secure Champions League football. They secure Champions League football, okay. So, yeah, it's great for you, Van. That means Napoli are back to which, you know. Yeah. I, but, you know, Napoli will be kicking themselves over, over the results against Empoli and Fiorentina. Yeah, Roma. Six, yeah. one, four goals yeah. after 30 minutes. Yeah, I, I mean, the pressure is off them now, so I guess they can no longer <laughs> bottle anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> the only thing they could possibly bottle is third spot. Yeah. But, but I guess, like, if you finish third, you finish fourth. Yeah. It's just a little money difference, and maybe I don't know. I feel like Nap- a team like Napoli will be at least in the third seed for the draw. So I don't yeah. think it changes that much. That's true. That's true. And let's move over to the German teams because this week could be a start for German football. For the first time in over 25 years, we might see a German team in Europe that's not named. I track Frankfurt. Mm-hmm. They they're playing against West Ham. They won in the London Stadium. They won at the London Stadium, and they won all their away games. What makes them so special? In this competition? At Frankfurt, are energy dim- are energy gods. <laughs> These <laughs> guys, it's not easy to play against them at all. <laughs> it's not easy. Away from home, like I said many times. The playing away from home suits these guys down to the ground because you're all go, obviously as the home team going to take risks and they love it when they have space to quickly transition into and it's like the transitions happen so fast like it's 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 almost unbelievable you know Oliver Glasner has really drilled in his philosophy of quick transitions into this team and yeah it would be nice to see them win the. Europa League, so that, you know, I can say Barcelona lost to this front <laughs> super team. <laughs> yeah, and they're currently ninth in the Bundesliga. Yeah, because they draw so much. It's not necessarily because of losing, they just draw so much. Their only two so, wins in their last 10 games are against Barcelona and West Ham. West Ham, yeah. And they beat Betis, so Betis almost like beat the Yeah, they beat Betis too. So, and with Leipzig, like, do you have confidence that they would be able to finish the job in Scotland, or are Rangers going to do what they did against Dortmund and Rangers are Rangers are a very strong team, so I don't think this one is over by any stretch of the imagination because it was really hard for Leipzig to get past them in the first place. So this game is definitely I can still see that game having one or two more twists in it. Maybe it goes a treat to either way. It gets extra time. Who knows? No, yeah. And the, have you been following the conference league? That, that, that's also pretty exciting too. Yeah, I've been following the conference league. Marseille with a, a rather unexpected loss against Feyenoord away from home. And Leicester, yeah. and, Leicester and Roma drawing. So those two ties are pretty much alive. Yeah, Marseille, they followed up that loss, but the freeze are pumping by Leon. Seems like Jorge Sampaoli is going to Jorge Sampaoli. <laughs> can uh, Marseille, yeah. like, at home, do you mm. feel they can overturn that? that to go through? Yeah, at home, they can definitely overturn it. And looking at Marseille's lineup for the Leon game, they played a pretty strong team. So, like, I guess... <laughs> It will be more worrying as they lost that much by that much to Leon, who, you know, Leon have their own defensive issues too. Yeah, the, it's crazy in the French league. Like, Leon is struggling. Everyone, it seems like everyone apart from PSG is struggling. PSG yes, yeah, are the ones str- also struggling <laughs> too. Sure, yeah, but they're getting results though. Although this weekend they drew 3 3 to Strasbourg, which were sort of a Cinderella story. Yeah, Strasbourg, Strasbourg are close. Strasbourg have a chance to get the get to the Europa League or just settle for a conference league, which is pretty great either way. 
Yeah, Kevin Gamera, man. The god. Yeah, Ke- Kevin Gamera. Kevin Gamera. Uh, he's Kevin Gamera is a really good player in his prime. You know, it's good to see him back at Strasbourg and doing nice things for them. Yeah, but it's it seems between Marseille and Strasbourg they're pretty interesting teams that I've been to. There's of mm-hmm. there's obviously Ren, who are coached mm-hmm. by Bruno Genesio. There's mm-hmm. Monaco, who we all know them. They have the magical Vincent Benieta, and there's mm-hmm. Nice, who are coached by Christophe Tatier. It's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, so. it's pretty interesting. And before we wrap up, let's speak a bit about two topics. Chelsea, they lost again. Are they in trouble? Uh. Um, top four is pretty. I don't, I don't think Chelsea will drop out of the top four because Tottenham, who are fifth, also have difficult games. They have to play Liverpool next week. They have to play Arsenal. And Arsenal are looking pretty strong right now. So I guess Chelsea are safe. But the future for Chelsea on the pitch and off the pitch is pretty uncertain right now. Like what? Yeah. All of their defenders are practically being. Are practically linked with the two big Spanish teams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're like players that need to, players that are on long contracts that they can keep, but some of these players need to really show consistency because Chelsea are a team where one player has a very good one month and then he drops off, another player picks up. So they need at least three of these players to be consistent at the same time. And for them, their, their hope would be that results improve and they can challenge City and Liverpool better. Yeah. Yes. And there's so much uncertainty about it. it's going to be their owner, mm-hmm. the money he has, like the owner of Nice bid a billion euros to like to see that. We'll see whether that that comes to fruition. Mm-hmm. And also, finally, did you know Marek Hamsik became a league winner this weekend? Huh? Mark Hamsik, she finally went away from the Napoli uh, bottling. Oh, yeah, league, I remember him. Yeah, he, he yeah, was in, the, he's in the Swedish league now, right? No, it's a Turkish with Trezorsvall. Oh, yeah, I remember he moved from the Swedish team to Turkey. Well, he won. Oh, that's, that's nice. They won their first league title in 28 years. It's, it's crazy what happens when you go away from teams like Napoli and Spurs. You <laughs> all of a sudden get the winning gene. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not always, it's not every time you win away from those clubs. Sometimes you can take the man out of the club, but you can't take the club out of the man. <laughs> yeah, but recent, recent like people like Trippier, like they were just with that. <laughs> yeah, but with that, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks again, Oscar, for coming. And uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.